Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. Microtik make incredibly powerful routers at a very affordable price. And this week, we're going to learn how to create a Wi-Fi hotspot for this studio space. But the information that I'm going to teach you is going to allow you to create your own Wi-Fi hotspot for guest access for your business or for your home. And with this information, you're going to be able to lock down that access in such a way that one, the people who access the guest Wi-Fi are not going to be able to milk all your bandwidth because you are going to throttle it. And two, the people who access your guest Wi-Fi are not going to have access to your personal files or other resources within your private network. This is an isolated wireless LAN that we're going to be creating today. Stick around, I'm going to show you how to do it right after this. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local show times, visit Category5.tv. Now, this broadcast would not be possible if it was not for the support of our community. And in particular, I want to say a big thanks to BP9, Scott Barkley, Ron Morissette, Jerry Kowalski, Jonathan Garby, Jens Nissen, Bo Lechnowski, and Bill Marshall, plus everyone who has supported this show, be it through Patreon uh, at patre patreon.com slash category five or uh, via um, our Kickstarter campaign that recently wrapped up that helped to put us into this space and is allowing me um, the funding that I need in order to basically build the studio. Slowly but surely we're getting there and uh, you know chipping away at this and that as we go and some things are starting to uh, come in over the past couple of weeks that, uh, that were ordered like a month and a half ago. Uh, I still can't have the contractor here. Um, I believe that is opening up. Uh, but now, of course, having opening, well, being that it's opening up, um, our contractor is jam-packed and has a, a very busy schedule. And I had to be honest with him and say, look, I understand you're super busy. Let me know when you're free, uh, when we can book you, because what we're doing here is not an emergency. I'm going to make do. I'm going to do my best um, with what we have. I don't want them to come in and feel like this is urgent and it's an emergency and I got to charge a prime rate. So, you know, that's being frugal, Robbie. So let's, uh, let's just wait it out and uh, we're waiting it out together and uh, it's going to be great. It's already great. What am I talking about? It's fantastic. We're just not, it, it's going to get better. How can it get better than this? It will. And you'll be like, wow, that's awesome. Hey, before I jump into the show, if you haven't already done so yet, I want to encourage you, please subscribe to us on YouTube. If we can hit 25,000 subscribers on linuxtechshow.com, I'll do a dance for you. How's that sound? We're very, very close. Would you like to see Robbie dance? Oh no, now I'm committed. I should be committed. I'll be committed after, I, after I've done my dance. I'm not a dancer, folks. So please do not subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we are, we have two channels, okay? So, well, two main channels. We've got Category 5 Technology TV. That's where you're going to get the full one hour show back to back, like completely unedited. And that's your full show. Now, on the other hand, we've got LinuxTechShow.com, which reroutes you to Linux Tech Show on YouTube. 
And that channel, by contrast, is taking that one hour show and cutting it up into its individual segments. So all of the things that are covered throughout the course of the one hour episode become short little 20 minute clips, 10 minute clips, even two minute clips, depending on what they are. Uh, we also break up the newsroom, so every single news story is available for you at linuxtechshow.com. So if you see something on the newsroom that you want to share on social media, go to uh, linuxtechshow.com into the newsroom playlist and you'll see all of those individual clips that you can share and it's specifically going to share that one story that you have interest in or that you think that your followers will also uh, have a lot of interest in. So if you want to see me dance, hey, subscribe to us on YouTube and click the bell and you'll get the notifications. Now we've been looking at the Microtik brand routers and the full series is available absolutely free at cat5.tv slash Microtik. Now that our network is up and running, let's create a guest Wi-Fi SSID. Our guest Wi-Fi will have a throttled connection to the internet and they will not have access to our local resources. So that's network shares, printers, things like that. I want to lock that down. We're going to create a truly isolated Wi-Fi connection to allow guests, friends, customers, or visitors to use our internet connection without risking slowing down our, our connection or uh, without risking the integrity or privacy of our data. Um, so this is going to be a complex um, tutorial today. So what I've done is I've actually documented all of the steps that I'm going to go through at cat5.tv slash microtick so that you can follow along. Uh, it just makes it a lot easier for you. So let's get right into it. I am actually going to be going from those notes because this is truly uh, a sophisticated series that we're getting into right here uh, today, uh, or at least a, a aspect of the series. So I am going to be working on my pine book here and I want to just bring up my laptop. And the screen looks fantastic this week. Look at that. Uh, I've made some improvements here at the studio, so I think you're going to find that things are a lot easier to read now. Thank you for everyone for your patience through this time, because it has been difficult for many broadcasters, but uh, uh, we've made some improvements this week, so thank you for your patience. So the first thing I want to do in WebFig here is I want to go into my wireless security profile. So understand, I don't want those who are going to be accessing my guest Wi-Fi to use the same password as I use on my main Wi-Fi. That's particularly what I don't want to be giving out. So let's do that right now. Let's set up a separate password by clicking on wireless at the left here. And then I'm going to click on security profiles at the top. Now click on add new and, and you'll see default is actually my, my network. So that's the password for my network, uh, the Wi-Fi that I've already set up. And I'm going to click add new and we're just going to call this one guest. Just like that. Uh, one note is I want to turn off WPA PSK because WPA, as you know, is very, pardon me, it's very easy to compromise. So we don't want to use WPA. We only want to use WPA2 because WPA2 is much safer as far as somebody being able to uh, hack into your Wi-Fi network. So turn off WPA PSK, leave WPA2 PSK enabled. And then down here, because that is enabled, we need to enter a pre-shared key, aka the password for our network. So I'm going to use dum dum123 for this guest Wi-Fi. So this is only for the guest Wi-Fi. Remember that, okay? Once I've entered my password, I'm going to hit OK. So I haven't actually created a network yet. All I've done is I've created a security profile called guest and that security profile contains the WPA2 shared key for that guest network. And I notice that my default network is in fact using WPA pre-shared key. So while we're here, let's open that one and let's turn off WPA PSK because I do not want someone hacking into my main network and hit OK. It only took a moment's time for my Pinebook Pro to disconnect from the Wi-Fi and reconnect. The password hasn't changed, simply the encryption algorithm has changed. So now, as you can see on the screen, neither of my Wi-Fi security keys will allow WPA.
They only allow WPA2. It's as simple as that. Now jump into our Wi-Fi interfaces. This is where you see my 2 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz networks and I want to add a new one for my guest Wi-Fi. But I don't have another radio. So what are we going to do? We're going to share the radio with one of my WLANs. So we're not going to add another radio. We don't have to buy an access point or any kind of device. We're just going to use the same MicroTik router. So the only caveat of that is that it means that the guest Wi-Fi is going to be sharing the same uh, channel as our Wi-Fi, like our actual uh, Wi-Fi for our network. However, because it's a different network and it's a different um, password, they're not going to be able to access our things. It's just going to be sharing the same um, the same channel. Whether or not that matters, I don't think it does. Uh, all right, let's go add new. And we're going to choose virtual because we are not creating a, a real one. Now we're creating a virtual network here on our wireless tab in Wi-Fi interfaces. So let's create a virtual interface. First thing I need to do is always, I mean, give things a name. I'm going to call this one guest-Wi-Fi. And you'll notice I'm using guest throughout. You might use your last name or your family name or something fun for your guest Wi-Fi. You can do that, but for the sake of making this tutorial universally accessible and easy to follow, I'm using guest because anyone can go through these steps and then retrace and rename things if you want to, uh, but you don't have to do that. So on this network, uh, let's scroll down just a little ways and we're going to see something here called SSID. We know that the SSID for our network is basically what you see when you bring up your phone and you access the Wi-Fi and you see a list of the different networks. So right now I see Cat5TV and Cat5TV-5G and about a billion other Wi-Fi networks around me. But uh, I want to give this one an SSID that designates this the guest Wi-Fi. Now in our case today I'm going to call this uh, SSID simply guest. Again, I'm going to refer back to my comment that we're just making this universally accessible, um, but you can call that whatever you want. This could be, I could call this cat5tv-guest, which would be very appropriate because if there's some other network called guest, because that's pretty generic, uh, that could cause a conflict. But also, um, it just makes it so that when people come into the studio, they can say, oh, well, that's the guest Wi-Fi for cat5tv. Hey, what's the password? Dum dum one two three. Nice and simple, right? But for today's demonstration, we are just going to go with guest. And now the final thing that we need to do, of course, is set our security profile for the Wi-Fi connection. And we're going to change that from default to guest. So that's going to set so that we're using the password dumdum123 as we specified with that security profile. And that's literally all there is to adding the interface. Hit OK. Now, because I am making changes to my Wi-Fi setup, and because my Pinebook Pro is connected to my Wi-Fi right now, remember that Wi-Fi, uh, now the router is not rebooting, my servers and everything, my internet's not going down. However, the Wi-Fi is going to hiccup there because the Wi-Fi uh, transmitter is restarting or, or reloading those configuration settings on its own. So now that that's finished uh, reloading those settings, you'll see now that under wireless Wi-Fi interfaces, I have one called guest Wi-Fi. And that is a virtual interface connecting to uh, my Wi-Fi. So the next thing we need to do is we need to start routing how the traffic is going to flow. And do you get the sense here that, hey, if you, if you follow these steps and if you understand the steps involved in setting up a MicroTik router, um, you can do some really sophisticated stuff. At the top of this demonstration, I did warn that this is going to be kind of complicated. Not that it's hard. It's not difficult. It's not challenging. It's just there are a lot of steps. So go to cat5.tv slash microtech and I've listed those out in a documentation format for you and the entire series is available for you absolutely free. So if you want to follow these steps and you're a little worried about maybe fumbling over something that I've said or maybe I'm moving a little bit too quickly, hey, head over to cat5.tv slash microtech to get yourself set up with those docs. All right, so to create a bridge, I'm going to go over to the left-hand menu and click on Bridge. 
We can see there's an active bridge already running there, but we want to add a new one for our guest Wi-Fi because we want this to be separate from our main bridge. So I've clicked Add New, and I'm going to give this one a name. You guessed it, Bridge-Guest. Let's keep everything simple. I want you to follow this verbatim, and that's going to help to make sure that everything makes sense in the end. And you can always go back and, uh, and rename things if you feel that you need to. That's literally all we need to do in order to create a bridge. Uh, hit OK. So now, as you can see, we now have a bridge called Bridge Guest sitting there doing absolutely nothing. So we need to actually specify uh, how the ports are going to be assigned. So click on Ports, and we need to actually connect that bridge to our new guest Wi-Fi. So Add New, and then change the interface to Guest Wi-Fi. And the bridge, we don't want that using our main bridge. We want that to go to Bridge-Guest. And now hit OK. And now you can see right at the bottom there, guest dash Wi-Fi, bridge dash guest, all set, ready to go, and waiting for us to finish configuring. So the next thing that we need to do, obviously, we haven't told this guest Wi-Fi, the bridge, what IP block to use. And again, I'm going to back up to when I said I want this network to be separate from my private network. I do not want the guest Wi-Fi on the same IP block. I do not want their IP block to be able to access mine because I have network shares on my server and I don't want them to have access to deleting my files. Or worse yet, here we live in a world where someone could connect to your guest Wi-Fi from their Windows laptop and they have ransomware. That ransomware then goes out on the network and looks for network shares and encrypts all your files. So so even though you may have antivirus or you may even have nothing but Linux on your network, because they've connected to your Wi-Fi, they now have access to encrypting all your files with their malware that they have on their laptop. So we're creating a, a network that protects you entirely against that kind of infiltration, as well as the malicious person who would connect to your guest Wi-Fi and try to seek out private information on your network. So we're going to protect you against that. Let's set up an IP block for this uh, guest Wi-Fi. I'm going to go IP and then addresses on the left hand side here. And you can see here that my network is 10.0.0. So my IP addresses are all going to be 10.0.0.1, 2, 3, 4, so on, and counting. So I'm going to create a new IP block by simply clicking Add New. And we're going to make this one a little different. So we're going to go with 10.10.10.1 slash 24. And on the interface, Guess which interface we're going to use here, folks? Bridge-Guest. That's the comment field that I was talking about last week that we didn't really see. We don't need that in this case. Um, but you can add comments to anything that you add in WebFig. Hit OK. So now we have a new network here called 10.10.10.1. And it will assign IP, well, we will inevitably when we set up a DHCP server. See, there's lots of steps. Uh, it will assign IP addresses on that. Uh, IP block. So speaking of DHCP server, that's our next step. So we're going to jump over here and under IP, which is already open, already expanded, and we're going to click on DHCP server. And here you can see my current running DHCP server. Uh, but the thing with this is that it's got kind of a weird name out of the box. So I, I, the first thing I want to do is I want to open that. And I'm just going to rename this one local. And the reason I want to do that is I want to always remind myself that that DHCP pool is my local network. It has full access to everything on my network. You do not want to assign a guest to that. So by calling it local, it just keeps me a little bit more safe because it stands out as uh, that is definitely my local network. Now let's add a new DHCP server. And you can see that there's all this setup that you can go through, but I want to show you a tool that's going to help make this even easier. So I just brought that up, but cancel, and you can see there's actually a DHCP setup. And that's going to bring up a wizard that is going to make this a lot simpler for us. And this is literally easy breezy. We're going to change the DHCP server interface to bridge-guest. And then watch this. We're going to hit next, next. See, it, it automatically assigned it to the correct uh, network. Next, next, 
DNS servers, it's just pulling from my router, that's fine. We can change it. We're going to actually change those in a future episode when we set up a pie hole. That's not a bad word. That's actually a device that's going to act as our DNS server in house and block advertising, block pornography, all that kind of stuff. Click next, 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 next. Next. Just leave everything as is and we're done. Ha hoo! We've got. Uh, guest one and notice okay well why is it DHCP1 well my bridge guest I can see that it's bridge guest but notice it, it I didn't enter a name for it and so now I, I can do the exact same thing I can open that up and call this guest easy peasy right okay so now I'm at the point where I should be able to see the guest Wi-Fi network on my phone. So let's do a quick refresh of Wi-Fi here. And sure enough, there's Cat5 TV, 5 gigahertz, Cat5 TV, and one called Guest. So let's click it. Uh, actually, before I do that, I'm going to bring up an, a local network resource. I'm connected to Cat5 TV. I want you to see that I am, in fact, able to access local resources. So let's just bring up my VirtualBox login. There it is. So once I switch over to the guest Wi-Fi, I'm going to use that as a demonstration to show whether or not we're able to access those resources. So back in my Wi-Fi, let's connect to guest, enter my password from the security profile, dumb, dumb, one, two, three, connect. Obtaining IP address, and we're in. What options do we have here? Let's look at the IP address, 10, see the gateway? 10.10.10.1. All right, so let's uh, let's look at our browser again now that I'm connected to that network and let's try to access PHP VirtualBox. And you'll notice, yes, I am indeed still able to access PHP VirtualBox. I've clicked on the address bar and I've clicked on the link and it is loading. And that is simply because I have yet to create a firewall rule to basically and trap that Wi-Fi, uh, the guest access, and make it so that it's not allowed to communicate back with my uh, local area network or my Wi-Fi devices on my actual Wi-Fi. So the way that we're going to do that is back on our MicroTik web fig. I'm going to click, uh, I've opened IP, and then we're going to go to Firewall. We've already seen this on previous episodes of cat5.tv slash microtick. You can see I've added a couple of new things since the last time we were here. But what I want to do this time is I want to create a rule to be able to make it so that the Wi-Fi for the guest network is not able to get access to 10.0.0.1 slash 24. I'm going to click on Add New to create a new Firewall rule. And you're going to laugh at how easy this is. You'll notice the chain is defaulting to forward. That is what we want. So leave that as is. And we're going to set the source address. So this is, if the IP address is coming from this, then do this. So watch what I'm going to do here. 10.10.10.0 slash 24. So anyone who is on the guest Wi-Fi IP block is going to fall into this, the source address. Destination address, this is my network, 10.0.0.0 slash 24. If anyone from this network attempts to access this network, what do you want to do? Scroll down. Action, drop. So what we're saying is any source from the guest Wi-Fi IP block trying to access my actual LAN, we are going to drop those packets. I want to point out that this is unidirectional. So there may be cases where you want devices to access your, uh, your um, wireless network but not have access to your internal resources. However, you do want your internal resources to be able to access them. Think about perhaps an IP camera that uses Wi-Fi to connect. Well, you want it to be able to connect to the internet. You want it to be able to um, access the network. 
and you from your computer on your LAN want to be able to access that camera, but you don't want that camera to have the rights to access your things on your network. It's just an example, but I mean, you can probably think of devices that you'd want to have uh, kind of separate from your network. So that if somebody grabs it, if somebody steals it, let's say you've got a Raspberry Pi sitting in the roof somewhere connected to your Wi-Fi. Well, if someone steals that, you don't want them having access to your network. So putting it on a separate network, but allowing you to be able to connect to it. So we understand that. We're doing this unidirectionally. This is only going to affect the guest Wi-Fi. This is not reducing, it's not eliminating my ability to connect to the devices on the guest Wi-Fi. Let's hit OK. And now we have that route set up. However, you notice it has placed it at the bottom. And we've already talked about this. We want to make sure that our forward rules happen before some of the MicroTik stuff. And I certainly want to make sure that this happens before the rules that I've created uh, if they involve internal infrastructure. I want this one to happen after um, this. No, I don't. I want it to happen before this because if they're going to access 10.0.0.17, I want them to do that through the internet, through the port that we've allowed. Uh, so if this was below it, they would actually have access to 10.0.0.17 because it would happen first. Uh, I don't want them to have that. I want them to have to go to studio.category5.tv. So I'm going to drop as the first Thing. So now, without having to restart, without having to do anything else, I'm going to bring back up my phone here, which is connected to the guest Wi-Fi. And let's jump back to my browser and let's click on PHP VirtualBox, which you see that progress indicator up at the top? It's hung up now. I mean, I know that I can still see PHP VirtualBox because I've previously loaded it. Let's go home and let's go there again. So. Uh, 10.0 PHP VirtualBox. Watch this. I've clicked on it. Where is it? It's not working because I am connected to the guest Wi Fi. This site can't be reached. However, is the internet working? Let's just go category5.tv. Yep, yeah, internet works a treat. Let's try to go back to. Uh, oh, wrong IP, 10.0.0.10, uh, .0 which is my VirtualBox server. And let's, because we know that's going to time out, I'm going to change to my Cat5 TV, 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. There we go, connected, and bring it up, and boom, I'm instantly in. So as you can see, we have successfully created a guest Wi-Fi that is separate from our network. They cannot access resources on 10.0.0.1/24. They can't gain access to that from our guest Wi-Fi. We're also going to learn in coming weeks how we can throttle that. I mentioned that uh, that we we're going to be looking at throttling, but we're out of time for this week's segment. Um, so I will move that into a future uh, episode as well. So make sure you watch for that. We're going to learn how to throttle the connection for our guest Wi-Fi to make sure that even you know if I give the kids access to it on their tablets, uh, their friends, and then the friends are down the road downloading videos through my Wi-Fi, I don't want them milking all my bandwidth. So we're going to cover that on a coming show as well. Cat5.tv slash microtick is where you want to go to get the entire series absolutely free. Please post your comments and make sure you subscribe to us at linuxtechshow.com, which is where I'm posting all of these as well, which reroutes to our YouTube channel called Linux Tech Show. Thank you for watching, everybody. We've got to jump over to the newsroom. Here is Becca. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.tv newsroom. IBM is laying off thousands of employees and seeking flexibility during the COVID-19 crisis. Account stealing malware is making its rounds on Discord. A pizzeria owner in the U.S. has discovered and exploited a flaw in DoorDash's marketing scheme and makes money buying his own pizzas. Microsoft has fixed a critical vulnerability affecting all Windows versions since 1996. And unmanned drones will slash NHS delivery times to a remote Scottish hospital. Stick around, the full details are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias.
From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Both Hewlett Packard Enterprise and IBM have announced significant cost-cutting measures, including pay cuts and significant job losses. The COVID-19 crisis is hitting almost every market sector hard, and now the dominoes are starting to fall. As other small, medium, and large businesses reduce operations or shutter for good, the tech firms that rely on enterprise clients are themselves taking heavy losses and laying off personnel. IBM announced its layoffs late Thursday. In a statement, the company said the highly competitive marketplace requires flexibility to constantly remix high-value skills, which in this case means deciding you no longer place a high value on the skills a significant number of employees bring to the socially distanced table. IBM, like many firms now facing cuts and layoffs, was not in the best of financial situations before COVID-19 hit. The company's CEO, Arvin Krishna, has been with the company for decades but only stepped into the top seat in April, saying at the time he was focused on building up the parts of the company that support cloud computing and artificial intelligence and was willing to move away from the rest. IBM did not specify how many positions were being cut, but both the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg News report thousands of employees were affected in five states. California, New York, North Carolina, Missouri, and Pennsylvania. IBM said in a statement it would offer subsidized medical coverage to affected employees for the next 12 months. Hewlett Packard Enterprise also announced its cost-cutting plans on Thursday as part of its more recent quarterly earnings report. The company will cut some salaries through at least the end of October, with executives seeing pay cuts of between 20 to 25 percent. The company, like younger tech brethren such as Facebook and Twitter, says it will further save money by embracing remote work in the longer term, allowing it to shutter some offices. Researchers have found an updated version of Anarchy Grabber that steals victims' plain text passwords and infects victims' friends on Discord. Detected as Anarchy Grabber 3, the new Trojan variant modifies the, the Discord client's JavaScript core upon successful installation, and this modified version gives the malware the ability to load other JavaScript files. When the infected Discord client is opened, the threat loaded inject.js from a new uh, Anarchy folder. This file loaded another script called discordmod.js and the two scripts together logs the user out, at which point they are prompted to lock back in. The new Anarchy Grabber variant then attempts to disable two-factor authentication on its victim's account and steals information including their username, plain text password, and user token, which it sends to the attacker's own Discord server by a webhook. The malware also attempts to spread itself to other Discord users by sending a message that contains the malware to everyone on the user's friend list. After modifying the Discord client, Anarchy Grabber doesn't run again, which makes it difficult for antivirus software to detect the threat since there are no malicious processes. It also ensures that a victim remains part of the botnet whenever they interact with Discord using the app. Robbie, how can a user determine if they're infected if antivirus can't detect it? Well, Becca, uh, tech-savvy users can open the index.js file and then they can check the contents. So on Windows, you're going to find that in uh, its app data. Just wrap that in percent signs to get there really quickly and then you'll enter the Discord folder. Linux and Mac users go to the .config hidden folder in your home folder and within that you'll find the Discord folder holding all the files. Now on any architecture the files in from there are going to be the same so whether you're on Windows, Mac or Linux you'll note that uh, that there are many many files called index.js in the tree from that folder. Um, so the one that you're looking for is in um, discord underscore desktop underscore core and the directory format is your Discord version. Now, in my case here on Windows, that's 0 .0 0.0.306. So I enter that folder, then modules, then Discord underscore desktop underscore core. And I can check the contents of the index.js file. And if it contains anything other than a command to require core.sr, it's probably infected. Thanks, Robbie. If you suspect infection, uninstall the Discord app and reinstall Change your password and ensure 2FA is re-enabled if it's been turned off. 
whether Discord, email, Facebook, or otherwise, be diligent and ensure you only click links you know you can trust. Since malware like this spreads to friend lists, it's also important to remember that just because it's one of your trusted friends sending it doesn't mean you can automatically trust the links. A simple did you send this question could be all it takes to protect you, your account, and your privacy. The owner of a pizza restaurant in the U.S. has discovered the, the DoorDash delivery app has been selling his food cheaper than he does while still paying him full price for orders. A pizza for which he charged $24 was being advertised for $16 on DoorDash, and when he secretly ordered it himself, the app paid his restaurant the full $24 while charging him $16. So he ordered 10 pizzas, paid $160, and had them delivered to a friend's house. The restaurant was then paid $240 for the order by DoorDash. In further tests, the restaurant prepared his friend's order by boxing up the pizza base without any toppings, maximizing the profit from the mismatched prices and it worked. Content strategist Ranjan Roy, who is a friend of the pizzeria owner, blogged about it. He said, I was genuinely curious if DoorDash would catch on, but they didn't. The curiosity stemmed from the fact that they had not asked to be put on the app, so it didn't make sense that the company would be selling their pizza at a loss. They later found out it was part of a cunning strategy to build customer demand and then use that demand to get the restaurant to sign up. Mr. Roy says, they have a test period where they scrape the restaurant's website and don't charge any fees to anyone so they can ideally go to the restaurant with the positive order data to then get the restaurant signed on to the platform. Mr. Roy is of the opinion that it's bad business. He says you have insanely large pools of capital creating an incredibly inefficient money losing business model. DoorDash is backed by investment giant SoftBank, which last week posted a record-breaking loss of nearly $13 billion. Thanks, Becca. We do have to take a really quick break, but when we come back, Becca's got more of your top tech news for the week, so stick around. Researchers have shown that a vulnerability in a decades-old Microsoft Windows component that controls printing could be abused by malicious actors to gain elevated privileges on the targeted system. The flaw, which they dubbed Print Demon, resides in the print spooler, and get this, it affects all Windows versions since NT 4.0. The component has remained largely unchanged since, even though another vulnerability affecting it was abused by the infamous Stuxnet a decade ago. Microsoft said of the fix, an elevation of privilege vulnerability exists when the Windows Print Spooler service improperly allows arbitrary writing to the file system. An attacker who successfully exploited this vulnerability could run arbitrary code with elevated system privileges. An attacker could then install programs, view, change, or delete data, or create new accounts with full user rights. Microsoft played down the likelihood of exploitation, saying that an attacker would need to log on to an affected system and use a specially written script or application. But as we know, RDP exploits are occurring in the wild with malware such as Sarwent opening a remote access to Windows systems. So in today's connected world, saying a hacker needs to have access to a system in order to exploit it is an irresponsible point to make, which could mislead inexperienced IT departments into complacency. The vulnerability can be abused to elevate privileges, bypass endpoint detection and response rules, and gain persistence. As part of this month's Patch Tuesday, which plugged a total of 111 security holes, Microsoft changed how the Windows Print Spooler component writes data to the file system, and it advised to download and apply the update. This exploit goes to show why running a version of, when, of Windows that is past end of life is unwise. The fix for this exploit will not be released to EOL operating systems such as Windows XP or even Windows 7, which will remain vulnerable to this critical flaw. Perhaps this is also another example of why it's high time to consider switching to Linux. Remote control drones will be used to deliver coronavirus testing kits to a remote Scottish hospital, and they're being flown outside of the operator's direct line of sight. 
backed by the local NHS tri uh, trust. Drone firm Skyports will fly drones between the Isle of Mull and Oban, the closest town on the Scottish mainland. We've reported on similar in, uh, recent trial programs, and it seems it's working as more communities begin tapping into the unmatched capabilities of UAVs. Uh, Skyport's chief exec, Duncan Walker, speaks about their recent trial in the Scottish area of Argyll and Butte, saying it provides an important short-term response to the current pandemic and lays the foundations from which to grow a permanent drone delivery operation across a network of healthcare facilities around the country. His company will fly unmanned delivery drones made by German company Wingcopter. The craft will fly the 17 kilometers between Lorne and Isles Hospital in Oban and Iona Community Hospital in Cragnur. While 17 kilometers doesn't sound like a long distance as the crow flies, it's a lengthy, arduous journey by road and ferry. By contrast, Skyport says it will take just 15 minutes by drone. The trial will take place using beyond visual line of sight rules requiring special permission from the Civil Aviation Authority. Drone flights that go beyond the operator's line of sight are normally prohibited. However, the main perceived benefit of aviation drones cannot be realized until the tech is proven safe enough to be, flo to be flown without a watchful human nearby in case of collisions. The trial will take place over the next two weeks, completing in the first week of June. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. All right. Thanks, Becca. And thanks to you for joining us again this week. It's been great having you here. I want to remind you that we are on Twitter at Category 5 TV. I personally am on Twitter at Robbie Ferguson and I follow back. So give me a follow and uh, I'll hunt you down and I will follow you. Hey, if you like to watch the edited down versions of Category 5 Technology TV, they're very shareable, they're very consumable, they're just quick little snippet videos, head on over to linuxtechshow.com. That's a great uh, YouTube channel to subscribe to if you love the content that we produce. And uh, as we already established, I'm going to do a little dance for you if you, uh, if you help me to achieve 25,000 subscribers within the month of May. I'm going to say that within the month of May 2020, uh, we're going to achieve that together. Um, Category 5 Technology TV is also on Roku. We're on other HLS players. Um, we're on Plex. We're on Kodi. Um, you can get our channels at github.com slash cat5tv. And of course, our main website ties everything together. You'll find that at category5.tv. And don't forget, all these web addresses and things, right? But uh, our series this week is uh, on the Microtik, and I do have a very special link for you at cat5.tv slash Microtik, which has all the details and the steps to follow in order to achieve everything that we've done here this week. So you have a wonderful week, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you again in uh, one week's time. See ya.